to be here. I always welcome the opportunity to speak about my work. I hope we'll have some fun today. Um, so yes, I'm here telling you a little bit about my book, um, which I'm very excited to have finished. And it's interesting that Gina's book came somewhat out of that same paper. Um, so we now have our books from that little paper we did in graduate school. So take note, graduate students. Um, and today I'm going to be talking to you about a portion of the book. It has a lot of different arguments in it. but um, one of the main arguments uh, has to do with fashion models, glamour labor, and the age of the blink. And each one, well, you all know what fashion models are, but glamour labor and the age of the blink will be topics and concepts that will become more um, clear to you as we proceed today. So let's start with fashion models, shall we? So whether you love them or love to hate them, fashion models are a key element in popular culture and their work is embroiled in debates about controversial bodily ideals. And here we have um, Victoria Beckham's models who in the last season of the Fashion Weeks were accused of being too skinny. And they are at the center of struggles for social power and acceptance. That's Anna and Andre, fashion power brokers. Um, and they are well known in the fashion world. And models figure prominently in conflicts between men and women. And this is a picture of the accused sex predator with a camera. Terry Richardson. So needless to say, fashion modeling is a hot topic that pushes many buttons. Now, for all its glamour, modeling's dark underbelly has been well documented. For instance, we have um, a few years back, Girl Model was a documentary which uh, documented how models who are scouted in Siberia are taken to Japan and they're working in terrible conditions. And so it's a very sad story about how models are treated, young girls are treated in the modeling scouting global network. Um, I had the distinct pleasure of being on a European television show with the author of Jamais Assez Maigre, which I believe means never skinny enough. And um, she disagreed with what I had to say about <laughs> the hopefulness of the future of fashion models because she thinks the fashion industry is a horrible machine that eats up girls and spits them out. Uh, so there's a lot of evidence that modeling is not a beautiful industry and not a wonderful place for young women to work. Um, and uh, the debates center on whether images of skinny models cause eating disorders or damage to young girls' self-esteem. And this has been going on since the 1970s, which is significant, as I will illustrate today, that these debates really started vociferously in the late 60s, but definitely in the 1970s. And that's a, an important point to keep in mind. And what's happening now is really interesting, because there are models that are speaking out in ways that they never have before. So we have Sarah Ziff, who, who was a former model, and she started the Model Alliance, which is a group that's trying to call on existing child labor laws to help young models in their working conditions. And over here, we have, I'm going to say her name wrong. Um, we have 
Charlie Howard, uh, whose criticisms of the industry, the one here with the red lips, um, went viral, and she's becoming a spokesperson for, on behalf of changing the dominant images of models. And another former model, the one in the red t-shirt, Natalie White, has become a social activist who's advocating for getting the Equal Rights Amendment passed, because she's 26 years old and doesn't remember the first time that tried to happen. Um, but she's an artist, and she's trying to push for women's right af rights after her experience of being a fashion model. And here on the right, we have Alexia Palmer, who has made headlines recently for suing Trump models. Trump being the operative word, because they were breaking labor laws. And so um, she was bringing a lawsuit against Donald Trump getting a lot of attention. But here's my question. Will this controversy in which they're engaged bring about real change? Is gender inequality solely to blame? Would dialing back ramp rampant consumerism help? What are they up against? So looking at these issues as a sociologist, media and communication scholar, and feminist techno theorist, I had to look at that list to know what I do. Um, so, you know, we do a lot, so you got to write it down. Um, so I dug deep as, as this scholar. I was digging deep into the roots of the controversies about the fashionable ideals, extreme social power. And I found what's going on is actually very complex. And it's not so simple as um, these simple solutions of just tell the men that they're bad or stop buying things. So to unpa unpack these complexities, I did a lot of research. So and Gina was there for some of it. Um, I talked to dozens of models, photographers, stylists, casting agents, model bookers and agents, and agency heads. I went to fashion shows, model parties, castings, photo shoots, and fashion weeks. I worked as a casting assistant in a production company, and I called on my experience as an amateur model. I never got paid do, to do it, but I modeled a couple times. Um, so I called on my experience as an amateur model and followed the news, combed library archives, looked at images, websites, histories of modeling work. I read novels about models. I watched movies about models. Um, I read histories of modeling work. I tracked websites. I went to library archives. I did a lot of great fun research, and I'm sure you all are familiar with this kind of multi-level uh, approach. Um, and actually, one of the key pieces in the book was a lot of fun. I consulted how to be a model in instruction primers from the 1960s, 50s, actually, to the present. And that was a big piece of the research was these instructions of how it, what it takes to be a model over the course of time and how it changed. So this research forms the backbone of the ideas I'll be discussing today. And I did that preamble partly because every time I brought up models over the years, people would say, but models are too skinny, but modeling's bad. And this is true. But I think what we need to, to consider is the complexity of the situation in which the models are being too skinny and making us buy too much stuff. <laughs> so as I say, it's not just patriarchy or consumerism that's shaping the fashionable, uh, fashionable ideal. There's more to the story. And in the struggle for domination, different media forms from the portrait studio to the cineplex, channel surfing to Snapchat, deeply affect the body that's in fashion. So that's a big piece of the argument. So I really want to think about, I actually looked at 150 years of modeling's history, and the fashionable ideal is not just about being nice to look at. It's caught up in the economics of images and the machinery for making them. The history shows that shifts in dominant forms of making pictures, from snapshots to celluloid, from the boob tube to swipe and click, roughly parallel economic shifts from manufacturing widgets to manufacturing moods and later biologic biological states. So the gaze of cinema, calling a little bit on Laura Mulvey et al., and the, to the glance of television, television, to the blink of the internet and social media, all of these eras roughly parallel broad shifts in economy and industry, and these shifts deeply affected the dominant fashionable ideal. So for instance, in the current moment of the internet and social media, we are witnessing the tinderization of everything, from sex to politics. This is a regime that runs on split-second gut reactions based on nonverbal reactions to how images strike people. Who has time for reasoned analysis when it's, or reflection or th thoughtfulness, it's swipe right, swipe left, and get on with it? I call this the age of the blink, where images and Im information are moving so fast. Wait, don't blink. You'll miss it. So there's no longer a one-to-one -one correspondence between seeing a particular image and having a particular reaction to it. We live in a hyper-connected haze where lines between cause and effect are almost impossible to draw. So in this environment, claiming that modeling causes anorexia misses key reasons why the power of the fashionable image is so pervasive and so persistent. To reiterate, 
the fact that men rule and people like to buy a lot of stuff, are of course involved in making the model image, but some of the tenacious power is caught up in its tight links with shifting structures of belief, supporting ideas about right living and what it, what it takes to be a good worker. So let me explain. In the age of rampant selfies, it's hard to imagine the shame felt by 18-year-old Abigail Robeson when she became the unknowing poster girl for Franklin Mills Flower. When she innocently granted a portrait photographer permission to make a lithograph of her likeness, she had no idea it would appear on thousands of posters and magazine advertisements to sell flour. She was mortified and angry. She sued the company because modeling was not something polite ladies of society did. That was totally associated with prostitution and the demi mondaine, and it was a shameful thing to be doing. So she sued the company, claiming she had been an object of derision, with jeering neighbors calling, causing her mental distress, for which she demanded $15,000 in damages. In 1902, that was a pretty penny. So, and her lawsuit broached the idea that a photograph might violate a person's right to privacy. So that lawsuit started a chain reaction that kick-started modeling as a paid job, and consequently a person's look became a thing that could be bought and sold. And I know I'm t saying I wasn't gonna speak extemporaneously, but I keep thinking about this lawsuit and lawsuits now with our biometrics and our facial data being stored and suing Facebook for owning that data and whose data is that. And I see some really interesting parallels. So even though we started to own our look and, and own our images because of the change in the legal system and ideas about the right to your face, models were not the sole owners of their images. In the early days, they were cogs in an image-making machine, just like workers in a Fordist, Fordist assembly line. You get enough of them doing the same thing and you have a product. Let me explain this. In the early days of modeling, being a model meant being a model for a particular house, design house, and its attendant look. The French couturier, Paul Poiret, for instance, preferred his models rounded and plumped, plump. So Paulette, he said, was for a long time the one I preferred with round arms and rounded shoulders. She was plump and elegantly rolled as a cigarette. So early models' bodies were corseted into the shape that was in fashion to produce a uniform appearance and silhouette. They did not engage in the total exposure of every inch of skin that is common today, or every inch of their lives, which is common today. Um, in fact, they were um, part of the designer's persona, and it was the designer who had the image to uphold. And so when Poiret went on a tour of Europe in 1911, his mannequins wore a traveling uniform of identical blue serge dresses and beige plaid cloaks, and each model, similar in height and carriage, presented a graphic figure amplifying the effect of Poiret's image six times over. So those were his identical mannequins, and they were actually interchangeable. <coughs> and I'm fast forwarding a little bit for the sake of time, but in the mid-century of fashion modeling's history, uh, in mid-century modeling, whether on the runway or off, off crafting the Crafting the model image was a norm in the industry. So when they started working for more than one designer, as even then models' public lives were still staged and scripted by their agents. The model's look was an agency affair. So here we have John Robert Power's models, which he called the long-stemmed American roses. So if you became a John Robert Power's model, it wasn't like your name was Giselle, you were John Robert Power's girl, and you had the look, and you would present the models in these staged stunts uh, all pretty maids in a row, and they would fly to Florida and get photographed in bathing suits, and it was all this big um, show of his image as the model agent. Um, so his long stem American beauties uh, were working their image to the hilt on his behalf, and showing up in bathing suits was one of their professional obligations. But what I think is really interesting is the way that models as a group were being presented in the publicity photos interestingly parallels what's going on with the prevalent values of uniformity and standardization that were epitomized by factory line production at that time. And the series of images that were made into a whole by the gaze of cinema. The gaze technology of cinema takes a series of images and sutures them into one whole. So these values were idealized by an image of identical beauties all in a row moving in lockstep position, embodied by the Tillers girls, the Rockettes, and Busby Berkeley's creations for the cinema. And I'm playing off ideals, ideas from the Mass Ornament by Krakauer here. So Siegfried Kr Krakauer. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, so, and I thought it was really interesting to see that these images so mirror, mirror each other, which obviously this is a shop floor, and those are entertainment images of um, similar time frame. 
So as sociologist Liz Moore and others such as Deleuze have pointed out, cinema is a technology of editing, suturing, crafting, and artifice. And it's an imaging style of the long look. It's not live. It's not unfiltered. It's the product of engineering and a little make-believe. So as these cinematic values permeated the culture, they affected not only how models were managed, but the look of the fashionable ideal. Consider the mid-century fashion model. She's haughty, remote, elegant, refined. Formed in the crucible of Hollywood glamour, the rarefied domain of haute couture, and the growing field of fashion photographer, she was a complex creation, indeed. So, in fact, from that time frame, values inspired by mid-century fashion photographers, to these values of cinematic values of staging and crafting and engineering the image fed into the fashion image, and they made these dramatic scenes with elaborate set pieces, the yards and yards of tulle or gorgeous settings such as Parisian Boulevard, and the settings were just as important as the models. And so we can see some examples here where we wouldn't expect to see on the cover of a magazine the models got her back to us. We don't even see her face. We don't know who she is. Uh, but this was a more common practice at that time. And mid-century -fas fashion was all about feats of mechanical engineering. Um, and we really, oh, it's going off. That says the engineered body. I'm not sure why it went off the screen. Um, but these feats of engineering and forming the fashionable ideal were also part of engineering a fashionable look. So there was no need to work on one's physique. A basic figure could be waist cinched and bullet broad into submission. And one of the earliest existing modeling guides I consulted was a 1954 book called Secrets of Charm by the publicity monger John, John Robert Powers. And his advice for the perfect model figure was corsetry. So as he said, and I quote, four factors always figure in to adding up to the ideal figure. In order, they are proper diet, exercise, posture, and corsetry. So as we shall see, this attitude stands in stark contrast to the advice given models about how to achieve the fashionable look in the next imaging re regime that was to come. So while the mid-century fashion mannequins carefully manufactured and powdered perfection resonated with the highly edited world of Hollywood movies, the dawn of the television age brought the instantaneous moving image into our living rooms. This shift profoundly affected cultural ideals. Soon fashion's haughty ice queens were replaced by the newly approachable gamines, the young cute girls, the gamine. But models as ice queens? That's not a familiar image. However, as fashion historian Jean-Noël Jean Lio has pointed out, in the cinematic era, the typical runway mannequin's demeanor was unsmiling, and I quote, glacial and immobile. They were disdainful beauties that projected an air of distinguished boredom. As fashion historian Caroline Evans observed, in the 1950s, models slithered along the catwalk, at most pulling on or off a glove. And this is the famous Bronwyn Pugh, who was um, someone observed that when she walked down the runway, she looked as if she was dragging uh, a skin that her mate had just pulled off of a wild animal. And she, <laughs> she was very disdainful of anyone in the room because she was in charge of it all. So, but something happened in the social upheaval of the wild and crazy 1960s and 70s in the United States, at least, but also it happened in Europe. Um, so in 1965, fashion doyenne Diana Vreeland proclaimed the rise of the youth quake, a cultural movement where teenagers came to dominate the fashion and music scene. We have millennials now, but they were teenagers then. Um, and the new values of the television screen combined with the sexual revolution and other political upheavals, creating a perfect storm that usurped the soigné waist cinched lady in a black dress a black silk dress and pearls that typified the preceding era. In fact, the ideal woman was 36 in a black dress and pearls. That's what young girls wanted to be like. That was the epitome of glamour at that time. Um, but social media's current pull to be ever ready for one's close-up has its roots in its, this radical transition to the televisual or tele television values of imaging. Because television displaced cinema as a dominant imaging style, and the screen was no longer at a distance in a dark movie hall. It was up close and personal. The images on display had changed too. They were lit from within, characterized by immediacy, transparency, the happening, the now. Crafted, constructed ele elegance was tossed out in favor of immediate youthful exuberance. As designer Mary Quant's, at designer Mary Quant's 1964 show, models didn't mince or glide. They danced, jumped, and ran down the runway. As Quant described it in her autobiography, Quant by Quant, quote, one girl carried an enormous shotgun. Another swung a dead pheasant triumphantly round her head. 
perhaps too triumphantly, because the poor thing which we had bought from Herod's from across the road thawed out in the heat of the place, and blood began spurting all over the newly painted walls and even on some of the journalists. So needless to say, this is a completely different from the silent model smitzing down the runway. They used to hold a number that de depicted what the dress was and you could order it. Totally different story. And this is actually a picture where he's got the guitarist and she's dancing and you can see in the, in the front row there's practically children there. I mean, well maybe they're teenagers, but they look so young. Um, so, sorry. Okay, so Quant's publicity also, so think of John Robert Power's publicity in those staged events that, that were part of his scenario of what it was to have a fashionable image. Um, Quant's publicity abandoned the cinematic in favor of the caught on tape immediacy of television that was starting to dominate. And this shot was taken after Quant took her models on a whirlwind tour of several countries. As she explained, the girls worked nonstop for 10 days to translate the mood of her fashions into a visual effect. And images from all of the fashion shows they put on weren't immediately immediate or visceral enough. Instead, at the end of the tour, the New York Herald Tribune photographs, sorry, the New York Herald Tribune photographers, quote, jostled into the girls' dressing room, found them lying flat on the floor, absolutely out, and the terrific pace had tired them to the point that they were resting, not modeling, and that was the picture that the photographers took and it appeared the next day. And this actually was described in Quant by Quant, but my research assistant and I were curious to know if the picture existed, and after many searches through many libraries, we found it misfiled in a library in Queens. So we actually got the photo, and nobody's ever published that photo before, so that was an exciting, geeky research moment. <laughs> and she, you've all had them. So the blurring of what sociologist Irving Goffman called backstage and front stage behavior typified this time. And it's also evident in these publicity shots. So we've got these photos that are sort of live and the paparazzi are, are catching you, not posing. They're you're supposed to be, you know, au natural, which of course you know these are still staged. But there was less, less time to craft a persona for the camera. So her personality is more what matters. She's not a bunch of like one and a bunch of cookie cutter powers girls. This is Penelope Tree. That's Twiggy. And you know, I always wear a suede fringe dress when I travel, don't you? So it's something that she's caught in her personal life, life and it's something that's immediate and live. It's not staged. So I'm drawing some parallels. We can talk about them in the Q&A. Um, but I think it's really interesting that television's up close and personal aesthetic came to the fore in a cultural climate where personality was a rising value in work and social life. As the dream to replace people with robots started to become a reality, the need for people to become less robotic at work also emerged. In this climate, the economic value of personality began to take hold as the emerging service industries began to measure productivity in new ways. In the rise of speculative industries such as advertising, finance, and real estate, personality became highly valued in the ideal worker. No more pretty maids in a row, no more factory shop floor with everybody doing the same thing. A mass-produced and highly edited model persona was out being somebody was in. And who should have personality in spades but Twiggy? Girls like Twiggy and Penelope Tree typified the spontaneity inherent in the lit from within television image. They were very young, they were very dewy, they were very different from the older powdered constructed models. And unlike their predecessors, Twiggy was everyone's model, her popularity spreading far beyond fashion magazines, and her look was a significant departure from the former ways of styling the fashionable ideal. This young, fresh-faced, and accessible look was, um, uh, sorry, was dependent on her personality and her projection rather than her construction of an image. And according to model historian Bridget, Bridget Keenan's account, Twiggy was everywhere. Car stickers said, forget Oxfam, feed Twiggy. Oxfam was an organization trying to raise money for people who didn't have enough to eat. Um, there were Twiggy clothes, Twiggy eyelashes, Twiggy dummies in shop windows and in Madame Tussauds, Madame Tussauds Wax Museum. Children carried Twiggy lunchboxes and played with t Twiggy paper dolls. British teens imitated her hairdo and makeup style, and adults starved themselves to achieve a twig-like figure. Um, the importance of personality as an economic value is crucial to understanding what happened in the rise, the rise of the regime of the glance of television. So we had the gaze of cinema, and the book is organized this way. So the gaze of cinema and the glance of television, and then we'll move into the blink for the latter part of the talk. Um, so this shift laid the groundwork for the system of glamour labor. Lam I can say my own concept. This system of glamour labor with which we contend today, a concept I theorized in the book. And as the story unfolded, 
my research uncovered how girls like Twiggy upped the ante. The general public became involved and started feeling pressures to be more model perfect in the flesh themselves. And this replaced specialized knowledge of corsetry and other forms of artifice used to construct the model look, which was just for fashion models. So in the process, the glamour labor, typical of modeling, was sold to the general public as something everybody should try to do. So this is one of the main concepts of the book, and it actually grows out of trying to make the idea of affective labor a little bit easier to understand. Um, but then once I went down that road, it kind of took on a life of its own. But it has its roots in affective labor. So glamour labor is a phenomenon of the internet age, although I argue it has its roots in the television age. And we live in a selfie society where one's look and image are becoming as important to one's success as one's skill set. And I hit on the idea of glamour labor when trying to explain the model look. So in modeling, a model isn't just herself or himself in person. Their look is, this is a comp card, which when a model tries to go get a job, they bring this card and now they email it. But on the card, you see all the different places and ways that the model appears in their print image, in their two-dimensionality. But also on the card, we have the measurements of the model's body, and then the model brings the card in person in their body, in the flesh, and the whole ensemble is the look. The physical model and the virtuality of the pictures of the model are the look. So it was a really interesting nexus at which to study what goes on when the physical body is digitized into your image in the virtual world of online and, and social media. Um, and I theorized that this idea of marrying the physical body and the virtual self into one was helpful in trying to understand the idea of affective labor, which drew me to study models. And we can talk more about affective labor in the Q&A. Um, but essentially, glamour labor combines the work on the body to make the physical body have a certain aesthetic with the work on the image self-branding, et cetera, so that when you appear in person, you are as interesting and fascinating and gorgeous in person as you are in your Instagram feed or on Snapchat or whatever else. Well, actually, now I don't know how you would do Snapchat because I don't know how to make rainbow vomit came out. I don't know how to have a unicorn. I don't know how to do that. But up until Snapchat, we were all trying to match what we had put out there on Facebook or whatever it is. And that trying to match in person what you are online, I've described as glamour labor. And I'm doing OK. I have like 10, min uh, 10 minutes or so, 15 minutes. OK, so I tried to track the evolution of this kind, kind of labor. And I've decided to go to the top and look at advice aimed at those seeking to enter the inner sanctum of modeling and all of its ideals. And the memories of the model agents and managers I spoke to only went back so far. So I went to the archives. I explored modeling how two, two books from the 50s and, 60s, 50s and 60s to the present day and it was amazing when I went in, I was like, oh, this maybe happened. And when I read the books, it was a really clear shift. So modeling presented originally in the 50s and 60s, it was viewed as sort of a specialized practice. And then it changed into something everybody should do. Mm -hmm. So in this transition, model experts' advice marked, marking barriers to entry morphed into instructions on how to do it with all comers welcome. Just so long as they were willing to work hard enough, anybody could model. And this opening up is crucial to understanding the fashionable look of today in order to grasp why so many are fascinated by trying to achieve it and why the fashionable ideal holds so much cultural and economic power. And these are some, I actually bought some books off eBay and these are some of the covers of the books that I've consulted. So, and I just want to draw a clear line. Up until the 60s, there had been a line that, that uh, existed between the more approachable and perhaps achievable body and look of the film star versus the remote and aspirational look of the fashion model. And this is especially important to think about when we get into this era when we always say, oh, but women were considered beautiful if they were curvy. But 1950s fashion models more often looked like the one on the right. They were not curvy um, as opposed to the film stars. And even up until the 60s and 70s, it was kind of the same dichotomy. But then, as I argue, Twiggy was kind of a hinge point. It wasn't Twiggy's doing, but she existed at a moment, a cultural hinge moment of change. So up until Twiggy's era, you either had it or you didn't. So in the modeling manuals, I found if you're a size 14 and always will be, don't make yourself sick by dieting. Think about another career. This is from 1964, just as the transition was happening. In the 50s, model manuals recommended a few stretches, maybe walking around with a book on your head. Exercise was not really a serious thing. Um, there was no such thing as a gym rat that was at least not a female gym rat. 
at that time. But then in the 70s, we start seeing something happening, right? I don't know if anyone in the room is old enough to remember figurines. <laughs> yeah, basically like chocolate dipped graham crackers you were supposed to eat instead of food. Um, but there was a whole dieting culture and, um, and a, a norm that the idea was that if, as the manual said, in the 70s I found one of them said that um, instead of just dropping it if you don't have the right body, you should take off the excess weight by going on a diet and exercise it away. So uh, we didn't have foundation garments anymore. Instead, we had uh, diet pills, exercise machines, mood enhancers, and plastic surgery to help achieve the fashionable ideal. And in the 70s and 80s, we also saw a rise in gym memberships, a growth in diet culture, and fitness was seen as a desirable lifestyle for all. Um, and in this changing discourse, there was also multi-causality, right? In the changing discourse of women's rights, increased acceptance of bodily display and relaxing sexual taboos, more and more people started to think, wow, modeling could be a great way to make a living. It's not looked down on anymore. And then it opened the pool of aspirants. So there were more people trying to model and management grew much pickier, partly because there were more models, but then also, um, well, there are two reasons. So one is that then there were more and more people wanting to model. And so in the eight, 1980s, the variety of body shapes and types evident in early modeling, which I discussed in the book and I didn't show today, but there's graphs about how there used to be more types available in modeling, um, that fell away and was replaced by a very narrowly defined set of statistics, which solidified into a classic female fashion type. A 1984 man manual was succinct. The girl who could model was five foot seven to five foot 11 with well-defined bone structure, well-defined bone structure, wide set eyes, long legs, and perfectly proportioned. A 1980s model manual recommended more intense body surveillance and control, sharing far more detailed instructions for getting the model figure as we see here, saying curves are not assets in fashion modeling. Excess weight could turn an agent off immediately. And you see here, these are actual exercises that might actually change your figure as opposed to walking around with a book on your head. Um, so the idea that the bot, not any body not meeting the standards could be fixed was coupled with these tightening entry requirements, and then something really strange happened in modeling. While the idea gained currency that everyone who tried could be a model or just look like one, which was a famous saying of a modeling school that was popular in the 70s and 80s, it seemed that there were two opposite forces at work. While the boundaries of entry were becoming ever more narrow, tightening requirements met the idea that looks mattered less than energy. And the importance of projection, spark, attitude, and hard work grew with the effective economics of the age of the blink. So I won't read this whole slide, but we can talk about it later if anyone's interested. I'm sure half of you in the room know what's on this slide, but I was thinking about the digitization of social life and thinking through the shift from the gaze to the glance to the blink of social media. And I started seeing how new bodily engagements with media technologies incited constant engagement of being always online, always on, always in touch. I mean, basically what this is talking about is why is everyone addicted to their phones? And there's a story there that it, part of which is glamour labor. Engagement, right? Constantly engaging. So as an effective industry, fashion trends sweep everyone in their wake and then are just as suddenly are gone. And it's as mercurial and unpredictable as the weather. As one model agent said to me, you never know which way the breeze will be blowing each day. And sorry, I mentioned, didn't mention one important piece. So part of the story is that the value of the unpredictable grew. The unpredictability became something that we were trying to harness and, and make money off of or do something with. So fashion's incredibly unpredictable. As one model agent told me, you never know which way the breeze will be blowing each day. So in this unpredictable climate, models not only had to look good, personality, charisma, spark, and energy, and hard work became equally important as having the right body. So indeed, in the model manual, starting in the 90s, to the, with the dawn of the internet age to catch the fleeting attention, models became super exposed in more places in more ways than before, and the growing value of the unpredictable encouraged the idea that everyone should be a model or look like one. And as the super network public's jumpiness increased, the measures taken in the face of the effective volatility to ensure marketability became ever more draconian. So starting in the 90s, we see this paradoxical mix between anything goes, anyone can be a model, with, and any, any type can be a model, but there's increasingly rigid limits to, to getting to be in to be a model. So one 1999 gu guide was quite stern. 
You must not have any bulges or even any visible bumps. Long and slender is the guide. Arms, legs, torso, and neck should be as lean as the proverbial racehorse. But at the same time, this guide, the same guide, also pointed out that the more projection a model has, the better the look of that person will be remembered, and that's what makes the hourly rate skyrocket. So it was both at the same time. Anyone can do it, but you have to be this perfect because they have no idea what's going to sell, basically. Um, so quirkiness started to trump other standards. For instance, Kate Moss fit the bell, right? Sort of. She was only 5'7". It took a long time to find this image, but you see how much shorter she is than the rest of the models. Oh, but she had projection to in spades. Or Carly Kloss, she was given advice in the 2000s um, that since the look could only be achieved through the digital unreal of Photoshop, for instance, we have these completely unreal bodies in the two-dimensional images that the models are supposed to embody in the three-dimensional images. So Carly Kloss in this time frame was given the advice, you need to lose more weight. The look this year is anorexic. We don't want you to be anorexic, we just want you to look it. So it's a time when photo retouching and Photoshop actually took off in the 90s, and pixelated thighs were shaped thinner, splotches erased and pores and under eye circles and wayward hairs disappeared magically, but that look really could only be achieved through technological manipulation, and yet the models were increasingly expected to embody it in person anyway, which pushed glamour labor to a new high. And despite this tendency toward an intense lower limit in bo models' body size, there really was no ideal according to the models I spoke to for the book. They spoke about what sociologist Ashley Mears has dubbed floating norms, where really it's anyone's guess what it is that the client wants. And in the face of these fashionable whims, the models I interviewed were encouraged to think of themselves as potentially lucrative makeovers in the making. Would-be models were told to think of themselves and their bodies as something to be ever more thoroughly managed and constantly changed. And at the same time, they were taught to think of themselves as independent entrepreneurs in charge of their own business, where personality and pizzazz were all that mattered in the process of constant self-fashioning, which has some echoes to somebody in the room who wrote a book called Venture Labor. Um, there's, you can see there's some connections there with the CEO of Me Format, which was being dictated to the models, both in the, in the manuals and in the models that I spoke to in person. And one of them said that you must be in charge of yourself, you have to be responsible for your success, you have to be adaptable, you have to be pliant, you have to be original, you have to bring something to the table, be professional, look the part, act as if. Neoliberalism, anybody? Um, so we can see, I hope, that there are these parallels with the ideal worker, again, which I was drawing in the, in the seasons past, I mean in the eras past. So I have a few concluding slides, and if you'll bear with me for this last little bit, then we can have a Q&A. So from Twiggy's era onward, the pull for regular people to enter the rhythms of fashion amplified, as did the idea that everyone should do their glamour labor to be ready for their close-up while marshalling their energy to project the right image at all times. The mobile phone camera became the paradigmatic example of everywhere all the time photography that characterizes our moment and newly defines the fashionable ideal, which is now becoming the worked on, worked over, worked up, and constantly exposed image and Snapchat disappearing is a thing that happened after the book, so I'd love to talk about that in the Q&A as well. But as I found in my study, one of the main job descriptions for fashion model is to make the work of exposure, getting it, doing it, managing its impact, look like fun. Here, a model's work is never done. She's always on display, and these are models leaving the DKNY fashion show in the West Village. They've left the runway, but they're still being photographed, and it's resonant of what we now experience with street fashion photographers. Um, which are, I, there is a Seattle street fashion blog, so I hear. Uh, so when models like Cara Delevingne and Gigi Haddad express breezy self-confessional confidences on social media, their glossy girlfriendy rapport of the signs behind the scenes snaps and how-to videos model a lifestyle that encourages constant work on the look and constant self-promotion and fashioning is becoming something few can escape within our self-branding social media on steroids image economy. That's actually, that's actually Carly Kloss and Carol, Cara Delevingne cutting each other's hair in their PJs. I mean, come on, did that happen? <laughs> um, so in our selfie society, the idea that everyone should try to fit the normal, not that everyone should try to fit the model norm is shifting the ideal once again. Rather than thinking there are various types of bodies and there isn't much to be done about it, the work to achieve the look, or whatever it is, is becoming valuable. The work is valuable. So the message became anyone can do it if they work hard enough. Any body can become fashionable in a digitized world. 
So the very act of posting values the body within rising and falling metrics of likes, hearts, influence scores, and views. And keeping the number high becomes a sort of compulsion, the glamour labor to stay visible, relevant, to matter. When people copy Kim Kardashian's selfie, for example, they are driving an image economy, but who profits? Facebook and Instagram? Mixes of Facebook and Instagram, all of these things are, are technologies that mix pleasure and exploitation and get us all to sell ourselves. That's part of the argument I'm making with regard to glamour labor. And we can say who us is. Maybe it's not everybody in the whole universe, but there are many, many people who are doing this. And tweeting about or posting one's latest physical accomplishments, posting a selfie of one's newly enhanced butt, slimmed waist, or latest outfit, pulls one's bodily potential and connectivity into metering and regulation. And this availability facilitates capital's constant expansion. So the very act of posting puts one glamour quotient on the line, rising and falling by me the metrics of hearts and likes, etc. And keeping the quotient high becomes a sort of compulsion, the glamour labor to stay visible and relevant. And this is spreading beyond just girls duck facing in the bathroom. Um, and this is actually a picture of the results. I think some of these are photoshopped, but there's some cup you can stick your lips in and you suck on and it makes you have big lips. One of the Kardashians was marketing it. Um, but we're all familiar with the duck face, I think. And um, uh, so this sharing economy, though, has led some to try to break through fashion's barriers to entry using the free-for-all form of the internet to carve a new path to social legitimacy. Um, and some people are actually making a living at it. That's what's really confusing about it. So these are f successful fashion bloggers. And what I'm trying to elucidate, or what the book does elucidate, is that producing a valuable look was just once was just a fashion model's game. But now everyone who manages an Instagram feed or their Snapchat stories is playing by the same rules. Manage yourself, manage your images, be your best self, stay on brand. And in this cultural moment, this kind of innovation is highly valued. Disruption is now the name of the game. We never know what to expect when regular people are running these feeds. And in a way, we could argue that um, populations are being biopolitically divided into those who try to make the most of their glamorous lives and those who won't or can't. So it's, there's some interesting divides that are coming out of this kind of work. And adapting to these neoliberal practices have been sold to the general public as a road to profit. Further, opting out of having a public image or feed seems no longer a choice for many. For some, it has actually become an economic necessity. So I'm going to conclude with my last thought in the book. And that thought is that this powerful mix of pleasure and exploitation is at the heart of these processes. And it makes them hard to dismantle or even resist. So it's my hope that this book's provocations will highlight a path toward a saner, more habitable direction, one that's fashion forward without leaving anyone behind. So. Thank you very much. And there, 50 minutes. All right. <laughs> Seventh thing in inning stretch. <laughs> having a conversation. I hope there's some questions. Yeah. Or comments are fine too. Comment? Yes. I guess I, uh, I feel very distant from a lot of this world, um, just mainly because I'm not a big social media person. And I, um, I, I guess a lot of this was just new to me. But I did experience a, a sort of one entry into this in San Francisco five years ago when my sister was posted on one of these fashion blogs, right? That was like street fashion. And, and I, I'm curious how you see that as either part of what you're what you're describing here as glamour labor or something a bit different in the sense that those those blogs are actually in many ways about undoing the body as the image as much as sort of this broader context of street life that um, I don't know, that was how I read it at the time and so where you're situated in the mission at the street. So I'm curious how you can make sense of the on the body relation um, From where I understand street blogs, street fashion blogs, <coughs> they're more about, because we have this dichotomy that doesn't really make sense. There's an opening up of what's considered fashionable. It's not really a dichotomy. It's, I think it's kind of a false hope, sadly. Maybe there's some hope in it. But 
if you have this narrow fashionable ideal and most people are thinking, oh, I could never be that, the pressure to be fashionable doesn't apply. But then, if anybody walking down the street could become a street fashion star, then there's a wide array of people who could be fashionable, so that's great because it's more inclusive. But then it also puts that pressure on people who now, you can't even just walk down the street without worrying. I don't know if you're worrying, but there, I, there's someone I know, Ashley actually, who was a model who said, she, I just can't walk down the street in Soho without somebody jumping out and trying to photograph me because she had the look that was popular at the time that she said that. But now I think there are certain parts of cities that you can't walk through without somebody trying to photograph you. So it opens up that ideal and it takes it away from focusing on the body, but I think it also makes more space for people to feel pressures to be fashionable mm -hmm. and, and get pulled into the market, people who wouldn't necessarily seek fashionable clothing or locations or anything like that. So that's an interesting story. Yeah. Thanks for your talk. It's really, really interesting. Um, also far away from things I normally think about. But um, I'm curious, I mean, I know that there's a, a reason you're focusing on women, but as you're doing this research, um, thinking about male sort of modeling and presence throughout, like the male figure kind of disappeared it was the sort of in the image of the male, uh, I can't remember the names of the men who had the models, right? And then there was, I just wondered where the male kind of figure went, or if you had done thinking about that in parallel with um, these trends. Um, well, this has come up, I mean, there are male models, and it's important to think about male gendered roles within the industry. I chose to focus on female models, partly because of the whole John Berger, women are looked at, women are on display, it's the woman's job to be looked at and the man's to act, job to act. Um, and I was thinking about glamour, and that tends to be associated with the female image. Mm -hmm. However, there was some really interesting work that came out, uh, I think it was in the early 2000s, about male models and masculinity during the time frame that I was writing the book. And there is some reference to that work. So there are some scholars who are looking at the male model. And one of the interesting findings about the male model that these researchers found, uh, they found their findings, um, is that the male models had more pressure to play it both ways for their sexuality because they often encountered people who were interested, who were men, who were interested sexually in men in the setting in fashion so that they had to always be very mysterious if they were heterosexual about their sexuality. So that was one. And plus the idea that um, people love this fact apparently, but in only two industries do women make more than men. One of them is fashion modeling. What do you think the other one is? They earn higher wages. Um, it's pornography, which I think is linked with prostitution, but I don't know if it's public, published what it is that prostitutes make. But that, in sex work, it's less easy to get those statistics, but definitely in pornography and modeling, women always make more than men. But that plays into a lot of our cultural assumptions about what a woman's body is for versus a man's body. And this kind of effeminate, demasculine kind of setting is less attractive to men to um, work it. So it's really interesting to think about the male body. And I think that actually what's been happening since the 90s and the dawn of the internet and more glamour labor is that men's bodies are being objectified more, and that's not necessarily a good thing. But I also want to ask, do you all have academia EDU profiles? Mm -hmm. Do people do research gay? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you, you could argue, you could have to extend it a bit, but I, I would like to say that I think there's a little glamour labor going on there mm -hmm. in terms of just, it's not your body, and it's not your aesthetics, but there is an image making that's going on on those sites, which then you have to match in person. When somebody says, oh, I read your paper, and you're like, which one? And then they say something, and then you say, did I write that? But that never happens to you, right? I'm sure it doesn't. But I think that's also, I would argue that's a little bit of glamour labor, or even, I can't believe I'm about to say this, but um, for female professors, I don't know. I always do the chalk test when I'm buying clothes. You know, when you turn around, and you reach up to write on the board, that you still feel comfortable in whatever it is you're going to wear. Mm -hmm. I would argue that's a piece of glamour labor as well. So it's not really just fashion models. It's venture labor, it's um, mm -hmm. uh, aspirational labor, like all of those kinds of labors are the kind of promotional labor. They're all in a suite of understandings of labor in the social media and internet age and glamour labor is a piece of that story. So I don't know which one had their hand up first. Oh. You got Thank you so much. This was a fantastic talk. Um, and 
I really, there, I have a couple of comments, questions there. I really just love how you kind of co-map the shifts in the kind of regime of imaging technologies with the image of what a model is and what modeling is. Um, and I know you called it the age of the blank that we're in right now, but I couldn't help it. I forgot to thank how, Malcolm Gladwell for that. Yeah. <laughs> I did think of in person, actually. Be really, um, also kind of an appropriate metaphor, the age the of feed. the feed. Mm. We have our new speed, especially when you're thinking about kind of self-presentation and, and feeding and kind of the genderedness of hmm. modeling. Oh, that's um, so interesting. Like, who are you feeding? What's being fed? Mm. <laughs> the kind of con consumption, like the stomach of it. Mm -hmm. um, just something to think about. And that is really interesting. That was, and how just the act of posting has become what's really valued and how you kind of started to allude to um, how like the shape of the body is even what is less desirable now. There's kind of more of an openness to like the the city as being something that's to be consumed, or you know, all these different types of bodies are you know gaining acceptability, attraction. Um, and I wondered if in your research on this, or as you're maybe moving forward with this project, if you've talked to models um, or people who are kind of participating in this about how they're using their own technologies mm -hmm. um, as you know we have like the phone and the selfie um, if that's been a part of how you thought about it actually since after i finished the research for the book but i did manage to work it in a little bit before it got published yeah. um, there was a change in hiring practices and modeling okay. and clients started looking for models who already had 10,000 Instagram followers oh, or wow, had yeah. so that they couldn't you couldn't it was a catch-22 you couldn't be discovered and be made famous until you made yourself famous and then they'd hire you so and all of that prep work and grooming and they called it development used to happen a lot more before social media and now it's on the shoulders of the people who want to enter the field to already get the following before they could right. then so that was an interesting change because there are tons of model backstage selfie feeds and actually there's a very funny Instagram um, feed or account called shit model management, excuse my language. Um, and it's like they do these little memes and they say like, it's like it's a picture of a dog and it's in a bubble bath and it's a little relaxing and then it says um, something like when, you're, when your manager calls you and you have to be at a casting, now, now, now. And so they make fun of all the things that can happen to models. And it was deleted from Instagram for a while and then they figured out how to get back on. Hmm. So it really is an interesting, since I finished the research, there's been some interesting developments along what you're saying. Um, I think that was the only thing you asked. Oh, no, and also, you just were making me think of the slides that I had to delete because I didn't have enough time. <laughs> um, but I used to have a section on, oh yeah, where I was talking about the new inclusivity of fashion because of the fashion bloggers making space for bodies like these to be fashionable, but also for bodies like these are transgender models. I think this was in 2014, Barney's um, spring collection. And so, yay, it's inclusiveness, but oh, somebody's making money. So, and maybe that's not a bad thing, but it's just, uh, it's important to remember it's not just politics, it's profits also. Um, but I don't think these would have been possible if we hadn't entered the age of the blink and that hunger for all those different types hadn't grown out of those many, many spaces in which these images are, are being fed or put out there. Um, so I think it's both and. I mean, I think this is great. I think it's important. I think these changes are hopeful on some level, but I also do think that this is now a group that didn't have to worry and is now worrying about being fashionable. Um, so that's, that's debatable. We've had a debate about that. But yes, you had a question too, though, yeah? Um, I'm really excited about this project. I can't wait to read the book. Um, I was thinking, and I was wondering if you talked about this a bit in the book, too, about um, kind of the, the way that labor value is becoming recognized that may have been going along all the time, right? So I was just thinking about that, um, the book Age of Innocence, you know, Edith Wharton, uh, 1910s, right? And it's all about how she has to um, be fashionable in order to be marriageable, right? So that a lot of this kind of uh, work has been going on but been uncompensated or not recognized as labor. Not recognized. Yeah. So um, I wonder how you think about the, is it merely just recognizing that it always has been going on and so now it's possible to be remunerated or that there's kind of a sea change going on in the, the ways that people think about the, their bodies as as like currency or consumable? Um, I think I would, 
probably want to come down on the side of there are, are types of labor that were unremunerated that are now being seen as labor. And many forms of gendered labor weren't <coughs> considered labor when women were doing them, but then now that men are doing them, oh my God, we're not getting paid for this. Mm -hmm. So I mean, there was a whole interesting exchange on, um, now I'm going to forget where I saw it. Uh, but the, the whole idea of precarity and coming out of heart and negri and the whole notion of affective labor as they stated it was like, wow, there's this passionate, uh, creating passion and feelings and emotions in people and that's something women do. But then there's this other thing we're doing now which is like we're on the internet and we're making value for someone else and nobody's paying us and what's that about? And like that's part and parcel of some of the way that women used to work that, I mean used to but still do, I hope I'm making sense. Um, that now is being viewed as labor because not just women are doing it. So I do think there is a continuity, but there is a change insofar as the technologies available today are making those kinds of labor visible in ways that they weren't before. Um, so yes and no. Yes and yes. <laughs> I like the both and. But that, did that address what you were asking? Yeah, I was wondering, so do you talk about that stuff in the, the book as well? I'm not as explicitly as I did here, but I do have some discussion of Hart and Negri and what um, their understanding of affective labor was, is, has been, versus how I'm understanding and I actually call on some, I go through Masumi and then call on some of the neuroscientific understandings of um, the, the Lange, I don't know if I'm going to say it right, James Lange, is that it? Mm -hmm. Hypothesis about emotion and and just getting into like really some of those debates to try to understand because there's been like affect and affect studies and affectivity. Everybody says they know what that means, but I'm on the it's not emotion side. So I'm all about it's pre-individual. It's not. It's non-conscious, not unconscious, and it's about the. Um, I think it's just really important to try to think outside of just individual cognition when you're in a networked society and. All of us are interacting with these machines in this way where they get at us before we know what we're thinking or even know who we are half the time. So, well, we know who we are, but yeah. So, swipe, swipe, swipe. It's, ha it's faster than thought. So, yeah. I think along those lines, <clears throat> I really enjoyed your talk too. It's, it's really interesting. And I think along those lines of <clears throat> heart and angry, that they're kind of riffing on that, off that notion of a control society, of this sense of like Deleuze commenting on the ways in which like, you know, we the, the walls are sort of coming down on so many industries, like pharmaceuticals, right? It used to be that we would put people in sort of madhouses, and now everybody has access to pharmaceuticals. We're all a little bit crazy, right? And the commercials will tell us that there's a pill for everything, and and likewise with journalism and, and obviously education and so on. So the walls are coming down off of kind of hope couture. Uh, modeling and so on, and and but I think that there are ways in which yes, there has been these labors that are now being compensated or understood as labor, but there's also these venues, as you're pointing out, these venues where people are sort of thinking I can monetize my look, my lifestyle, my how, my home decor, or my baking, or whatever the case may be. Like right. Every nook and cranny of your body and your life is a is a venue for monetization. I just think it's really fascinating. And I'm, I'm interested also, and I don't know if it's a question or how it's related, but in the ways in which the high fashion magazines, well, not the high fashion magazines, but the, fa the, the ones that you see in the aisle at the grocery store, right? The main, the main ones, Glam and Vogue and Elle, they're almost all actresses on the covers, right? They're very rarely a, an actual model and no, inside pages are models. And then you have online, these everyday women and men who are showcasing their look or their home or whatever the case is on Instagram and so on. Mm -hmm. So I'm not feeling sad for the fashion models necessarily. <laughs> like, the the poor models. Taking their job, but but, <laughs> but, um, but there is this interesting. I, I, I don't know. I, I guess I don't, what I'm wondering is I don't know enough about the industry. Is there a? I don't know how to describe this. Kind of a battening down the hatches of like there's a particular. Um, level of modeling that then is, is like even more sort of precious mm -hmm. given how normal right, the right. glamorous lifestyle is. Mm -hmm. right? Anybody can sort of have an Instagram account and acquire a following if they've got a, a look or a baking style that <laughs> is interesting right. to people. So I don't know, I'm just wondering what, what have these things done to the industry to that the actual sort of fashion models proper? If actresses are constantly in, in Dior ads right. and Chanel and everything right. else, and then everyday 
bloggers can have these massive followings. And you open the magazine and the bloggers photographed in the magazine where the model would have been. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and I see this more just because I tend to follow like design blogs more than like fashion, but, but it happens there too, right? But it's like now bloggers have whole lines at Target, yep. of, you know, and so yeah. on. Um, not clothing necessarily, but like home decor and stuff. People who made a name for themselves as blogger. And so I'm just interested, what has it done to the high fashion, high fashion as an industry? I think the, 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 the dilution of it all. The 80s supermodels, 90s supermodels were the last hurrah. Yeah. yeah. In a way. And they were actually the Christy Turlington and all that. Christy that. Turlington, Naomi Campbell, yeah, those, that, that ilk of supermodel. Which the waifs did have an impact, but that moment of being super high fashion model also became the model that everybody knew. So it was this mix of the precious and the everyday. And they profited handsomely from that. But Many of the people I spoke to in the industry have another book that's an anthology, and it's called Fashioning Models. And the last chapter of that book is an interview with a couple of fashion um, agency heads and a, a lawyer for Ford Models, and um, a fashion two in New York, one in London, and this lawyer for Ford Models. And we ask them, you know, are the supermodels? Are there ever going to be supermodels again? And we take apart the unique kind of perfect storm that happened right then with cable coming up and models standing in for this huge new, um, and I do talk about this a bit in the book, so many more people interested in and paying attention to fashion before fashion shows nobody could go, and then they're in stadiums starting, I guess, the 80s. Uh, so yeah, is there, a, is there a space where there's the model that's so precious that nobody's ever heard of her unless you're on the inside of fashion? That still goes on, but it's in magazines called, like, have we heard of Visionaire magazine? No, no, okay, so like that magazine's very much. Really high end. So there's very high end, I mean, I guess one time, I mean, every time it comes out, I think it comes out once a year, like one time it was printed on metal, and another time it was like life size. I mean, it becomes an art piece, and then the models are modeling in this arty kind of fashion in a way that isn't aimed at the general public. Um, and yeah, I think that the fashion model as a job has become really not a very good job at all. And we do just see the actresses because everybody should be in fashion. Everyone should feel like it's accessible. I mean, Kim Kardashian is considered high fashion. Kim Kardashian's body is not a fashion model's body. Her history is not fashion model, and she's not a movie star. But she's Balmain, um, I never say his name right, Olivier T something. Balmain's main designer loves her. She's his muse. So there's definitely a mixing. I mean, we didn't have the high-low fashion at the fast fashion that we have now. It's definitely a mixing that's going on now where there isn't just the fashion model any, any longer. Uh, so yeah, you've observed something really important, a, a really important change. I'm going to jump in from Monica and give Monica some space to jump in afterwards. But you know, so what's, what I hear <coughs> what's fascinating here, right, is that you've touched on this kind of perfect storm of a shift in labor. That there's something, what I see here is something that looks what Brooke Duffy has called the aspirational labor, right? And or Oh yeah, I said it before, I forgot to cite her name. Yes, Brooke Duffy's aspirational right, labor. Or this notion right. of hope labor, right? Mm -hmm. this, like, this idea that if you only just put yourself out there on social media, through social networking and professional networks, that you, you end up making your own job. And what I think is... As long as you have passion. I just keep working more for free for a while. Somebody should write. Uh, but, but you know, that, that's the, I mean, that's what I think is really powerful about what you bring to this lens is that you're, you're essentially saying this is, this is deeply gendered in the way that we even are able to view this as the, the proto readiness for work, right? That this is, you know, and, and I think this ties back to a nice, um, co to, ties back nicely to a comment that Leilani made about, well, women have always prepared their bodies for appearing attractive in a highly gendered and sexualized world. So what's, what's new about this is about it's, it's part and parcel of that entrepreneurial self-hustle that you have to do in order to, and you have to do it within media. So I would, if you wouldn't mind, I would love to, for you just to flip back to that glamour labor um, text shot. So I love, so I love looking at all the, all the, all the, all the Dutch ones. Uh, where you did know, I do it? About the one where you say what is glamour labor? Yes, it's both I think it's earlier. And 
Did I, did I, didn't I explain it before now? Here it is. Yes. Yeah, it's more about the body and more about the image, right? And, and there's something that's really powerful about your, you know, about this conceptualization that is both the physicality and the material. It's both the materiality and the digital. It's both the, the technological and something that has to appear naturalistic that goes into the making of this new kind of work. And that's where I think you've got this space that you know, certainly mm -hmm. Vinci Labor didn't pick up and certainly even aspirational labor doesn't pick it up. It doesn't pick up the body as much. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't pick up this tension between, um, you know, I just woke up like this. Like, I'm supposed At no filter. <laughs> Sorry. No Hashtag filter. no filter. Hashtag no filter, right? <laughs> that there is this kind of naturalness on it. And, and, and then just to kind of comment, and I'll, and I'll step back and let Monica step forward, you know, the, what's, what's really interesting here is your connection that you said, well, this also, like, in academic labor, we'd like to pretend that this doesn't happen, but this happens, right? Yeah. So that we have this kind of, like, well, you know, here's what's the naturalistic part about us is that, you know, we don't pay attention to those metrics, we don't know what our age index is, we have no idea how many downloads we had yesterday on academia.eu, right? You know, that there's this kind of appearance that, the, the physicality, the materiality of our of our of our intellectual labor is something that is real, and that the image we're not really supposed to appear to work we're on. We're not supposed to care. And yet we're giving that advice to every single graduate student, right? You need to focus on what you're communicating about your trajectory. Mm -hmm. You need to focus on how you communicate yourself as a scholar. You need to brand yourself in particular ways. Mm -hmm. Even as we have this very tense relationship between that work on the body and the work on the image. So that's where I think you've got something even bigger than the fashion models mm -hmm. in this emergence of a kind of work that is, you know, that we're often, we're all finding ourselves trapped in the feed and trapped in the flow and trapped in the circuits. And has it not affected men? Because I was curious as I was writing the book and I knew I couldn't write another book while I was writing a book, but I did a little, just a little poke in to see what's going on there with the men and did you know? that there were these t-shirts that came with a six pack in the t-shirt that sold out almost immediately a few years back. And there are spanks for men now. I mean, there are, it's not as extreme because of the, this, the uh, no, we don't have the, it's different for boys and girls. Um, <laughs> but the fact is that the men are not immune to these pressures. It just may not be as immediate for them. But I do think it's really interesting that you're also saying that it doesn't even matter about bodies because we are all subject to these pressures over and above fashion, mm -hmm. over and above looking right. You, you, looking right is broader than just appearing attractive or what your body looks like or what your face looks like. It's and it's something true. in that tension between, uh, between needing to work on to, to do the work and also appearing that we didn't have to do the work. Because that's glamour in and of itself right there. Right. Glamour is all about, I didn't work on it. You hide it. That's uh, Nigel Thrithberg's about that. Then it glamorous is about hiding the work. Is it, can you say more about that? Because I'm not saying you're wrong, because you've thought a lot more about this than I do, but that sounds counterintuitive to me, because glamour seems Are you thinking drag queen glamour and the work done no, glamour? No, oh, that was not Alice necessarily. Marwood. I just want to hear you say more about it. I'm not necessarily disagreeing with you. I just, when you said that, I was like, huh? Um, well, it's like the, um, like it, the Wizard of Oz, and high. then you pull away the curtain. So in, that, in the conception of glamour I'm thinking of is that even though we know it is artifice, mm -hmm. that the glamorousness of it is, is its natural effortlessness. They're glamorous because they're not struggling to appear or be in a certain way, they just are. Even though it's false eyelashes or whatever and that's that glamour look or you've got you know, 400 citations on your academia at EDU and half of them were written by graduate students, that doesn't happen. Um, did I say that? Oh my God. <laughs> but the fact is that from, I do, because there are people who, glamour means different things to different people. So I have tried to elucidate that that angle is what I've been looking at. Mm -hmm. And Thrift writes, Nigel Thrift writes about mm -hmm. it in this way. And I think Virginia Postrel's image of glamour, her conception is slightly different. Um, but I know that, didn't you have a question? I did. I glossed right you over it. it. And you had, and Monica had another one? Okay. And are we running out of time? Oh, take a few. We're OK. OK. Um, so the televised um, fashion contests, um, Idol and Top Model and those shows, do they uh, feed this glamour labor, or are they an outcome of change in glamour labor? Uh, um, part of the way, those contests actually 
I theorize glamour labor working from another theory that a colleague of mine that's in that Fashioning Models anthology uh, wrote about. She pulled, I think his name is David Mao. There's a concept called the labor theory of beauty. And the idea of the labor theory of beauty is that it's not that you can't, like Tyra Banks and her America's Next Top Model show, the girls or boys or whoever they are come on the show and Banks' message is it's not that we live in a sexist or a racist or classist system, it's that you don't work hard enough. And if you work really, really, really hard, your beauty will bring you up through the ranks of this unfair system and you'll beat it. And so that notion made me start thinking about glamour labor as this way to individualize structural problems of various types. So yes, those shows are part of that story of glamorizing, working it, working on it as a means of success in spite of all odds, which we know isn't really how many Americans, America's Next Top Models became famous models. No one. But I mean, in television studies, we know there's Alison Hearn and other writers who've talked about how this, the showing of work as entertainment is a part of selling this kind of working for free as fun and, and glamorous. And yeah. Oh, well, Lori Boulet. I never say her name right. But yeah. Now, are there oh, more questions? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, <coughs> what I'm thinking when I, I'm looking at this relationship specifically, too, is that I feel like this is like the, the visual the visual rhetoric version of somatic metaphor. Mm -hmm. You know, when you have like a, something is that you're using um, a rhetorical device that calls upon something of the body. So, but the thing that is so amazing about it is that it seems like if you're working on your image and you're working on your body and you want in some way the two of them to relate to one another, it's like which one of those things are you relying on to call upon the other, right? Mm -hmm. And as our digital presence becomes like more and more significant, Right, even for our academics or online all the time, it's like, are you expecting, you know, is are you expecting your body to call upon your digital presence when you arrive? Wouldn't that or be are great? You your <laughs> like, Wouldn't you like send an edited version in? That would be so cool. Yeah, so I, mean, I don't know. I think I just I found that like super fascinating and interesting. You know, that you could create or you could craft some kind of digital or visual presence that would you know act as like some kind of like enthematic way or whatever to like recall the common version of you, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. I don't know? Well, you're touching on part of, because this project made me, I just kept thinking about it after I finished the book and now I'm studying wearable technology mm -hmm. and trying to think about wearable tech, fashionable wearable tech as an externalization of being fashionable, but I'm also really interested in the relationship between how wearable techs can work and striving for an ideal body and then when I'm really being sci-fi, I, I imagine, like, I thought the idea of, like, with holograms and projection, like, what if you could wear something and it's late at night and you're scared and you look six feet tall and 300 pounds, <laughs> and then you get to your destination and then you look, like, whatever. I mean, that would, I'm thinking, like, avatars. I was thinking crazy stuff like that. But I, who knows? Maybe that would be something that could happen. Right. And it seems like a dreaming that we have that isn't possible right now. I mean, you have to actually cut the flesh to change it through surgery, et cetera, um, to look like the digital idealized. Right, but like if you could have, like, if you could manipulate your own image, right, and have that exist online so that you looked fiercer, right, <laughs> then like if that in, in, you know, and if, if you populated your own digital sphere with that kind of image and that kind of thought that then when you showed up, mm -hmm, like people were supposed to conjure like you could, you know, strike that chord when you showed up, and then that would be the goal. Yeah. Of your personal human presence would be to strike the same chord as your digital presence. You're the avatar for the real thing yeah. that mm -hmm. exists on this. Oh, that's yeah. an interesting way to think about it. <laughs> Until people get angry and just refuse, or I don't know. I'm still trying to understand mm -hmm. what Snapchat means, but I'm all that biometric data and the databases and all of that's really. There's a lot there. There's like a glamorization of surveillance going on, and that, that's the glamour surveillance is my next thought too. And also, when you wear things, the Internet of Things can see you as a machine among other machines. And oh, that book is coming. <laughs> that's obviously I'm working on it. But it's a really interesting observation that you've made there. We should and, probably yeah, we tell should this stop. to an end to get ready for the next scene that's in this space. But will you join me in thanking Elizabeth for her? Awesome.